series of theories. And it has theorems, just like uh, geometry, and uh, Euclidean geometry has theorems. And so they have been developed over time using the same kind of logic that uh, was done by, for Euclidean geometry. And that logic forms the foundation for all of natural philosophy. So it's not just you know, geometry or mathematics. It includes linguistics and economics, um, uh, physics and chemistry and biology and all these different fields. So the first thing we want to do is we want to look at uh, what the trouble with physics seems to be before we get too far. And I'm taking my uh, examples from this book, The Trouble with Physics by Lee Smolin, and uh, in the little white uh, uh, part of the text here, right there, it says, the rise of string theory, the fall of the science, and what comes next. So, uh, Lee Smolin is uh, in charge of the uh, Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics in Canada, and uh, he has uh, 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 done a lot of work in this area. And uh, he has identified many problems with modern physics, I'm just going to show a few uh, here. Uh, you cannot combine general relativity with quantum mechanics, so our string theory and our theory to try and find the universal force and the, the thing that's in common with all of science is stunning. We, we, we're stopped. We have been able to combine the strong interaction, the weak interaction, and the electromagnetic force, but we can't combine it with gravity. Uh, the second problem is that in our theories of electrodynamics, quantum mechanics, and general relativity theory, we have infinity. General relativity theory, these are related to black holes. Uh, in quantum mechanics, it's because uh, in a finite volume of space, there's an infinite number of points. And when you have an infinite number of points and you deal with a probability a type of theory, there's going to be some points that have a probability of an infinite uh, quantity of something you want to know what the value is. And then, of course, in electrodynamics, if you have point particles, uh, when they get real close together, you get an infinite force. We have all these uh, problems. <coughs> and then we have a problem uh, with uh, understanding dark matter and dark energy, which has been proposed. In order to uh, rescue uh, general theory of relativity for uh, uh, spiral galaxies, the outer spiral arms did not obey Newton's law or general relativity theory in general. Uh, so they invented dark matter and dark energy. And uh, if uh, if you look to see, well, how much of the universe is dark matter and dark energy? Well, it's only 96%. <laughs> the other 4% is what we think is the, the, the universe. So uh, that's a big, if you think of it as a punch factor, it could be a big punch factor. <laughs> uh, then we have the problem with string theory. Uh, we have so many varieties that it's not experimentally falsifiable as a general theory. So if you can't falsify it, how can you prove what's good or what's bad? Yeah, how do you make progress? And so that's the problem. And uh, so what uh, uh, Smolin says, he says the ultimate problem in physics appears to be the discovery of the universal force. And we're going to be talking about that uh, tonight. So. <coughs> well, I'm going to use <coughs> meta theory to do this. And meta theory was uh, founded as a branch of mathematics by Henri Poincaré, who was considered one of the last of the great natural philosophers. Uh, we haven't really had any great natural philosophers, I don't believe, since the time of Poincaré. And uh, so uh, we're going to use four postulates, or four arguments for meta theory. The first one is that no two fundamental theories in nature can employ the same fundamental concepts. We'll take, for example, C, the velocity of light. Now, what are the theories that involve C? We have electrodynamics, we have special relativity theory, we have quantum mechanics, and we have general relativity theory. And it turns out that Poincaré was the co-inventor of special relativity theory with Einstein. He published one year before Einstein. Einstein kept with it. Poincaré stopped after 
is this argument because he says, I don't think special relativity theory is a fundamental theory. I don't think it can qualify because he says, I think C is the natural fundamental constant for electrodynamics. I don't believe these other theories are as fundamental as electrodynamics. So that was his argument. And Einstein never received a Nobel Prize for special relativity theory or general relativity theory, even though those are two of the four pillars of modern science. And uh, uh, he did receive uh, a Nobel Prize for, for electric effects, which was based on the work that his wife did at Weber's laboratory. And uh, when he divorced her, he gave her the entire amount of the prize because everybody knew that she had done the work. So they wouldn't let a woman get publish her paper. And so she had to put her husband's name on it to get it published. And uh, then that was the paper that was the basis for the Nobel Prize. The second argument is that only fundamental theories can be true theories. Now, today, we don't, we don't concern ourselves with that in modern science, and what's called the postmodern philosophy of science. We don't care whether theories are true or not. We only care if, if the predictions of theories can be falsified. So if the predictions of the theory uh, can, can't be falsified, uh, then the theory's OK, even if there's a lot of things that are wrong with the theory. The third argument uh, from meta theory, again due to Henri Poincaré, is that no two fundamental force laws can have the same mathematical form, such as one over R squared. And we have the force of gravity and the electromagnetic force both go one over R squared. Based on the previous arguments, Henri Poincaré guessed that gravity was really uh, the electromagnetic force. This was 1905, six, seven time frame. The final argument from meta theory is that according to the superposition principle, instead of theory describing the universe or an atom or a molecule or an elementary particle, cannot be logically consistent and physically stable unless it consists of only linear theories or one nonlinear theory. So when we try to describe the physical universe and atoms and molecules and elementary particles and things like that, we have these same four fundamental theories we looked at earlier. We have gravitational force, electromagnetic force, quantum mechanics, and relativity theory. And the electromagnetic force is 1 over r squared. That's nonlinear. Gravity is 1 over r squared. That's nonlinear. Quantum mechanics is a mixture. The, the Schrodinger wave equation involves del squared, which is nonlinear. But the wave function is considered a linear superposition of states. And in relativity theory, it goes in z squared over c squared. So it's nonlinear. So when you look at all that and you ask, uh, what's the status? of modern physics, modern science, and the, uh, the answer is, well, there's only two possibilities. One is, everything is bad to you, so. <laughs> and the other one is, it's possible that electrodynamic force could be the universal force, and if we did it better, we would explain <coughs> all the things that these other theories were intended to explain. Mm -hmm. So I'm following up on that last uh, suggestion. And so the question is, well, how do we do the derivation of the electromagnetic force better than Maxwell did combined with uh, Einstein's special theory of relativity? And the answer to that is a shock. We've known about it for 300 years, <laughs> 400 years or almost. And that is Isaac Newton in his book, The uh, called Principia, or uh, Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, he gave the steps for what was called in his day the empirical and scientific method. And he said, we're supposed to perform experiments in each field of science and uh, write the empirical information down in a precise mathematical form involving specific terms and with an equal sign in our equation which means you don't have a constant. And uh, so he 
said you should do that, and then after you've done that, then you should use a complete set of these empirical laws as your axioms to derive a more general force law for that field, and uh, by using uh, axiomatic uh, deduction. And you should do that in each field of science. Then you should use those more general force laws to predict additional phenomena until, repeating this process over and over again, you finally, by induction, discover a more general force law that seems to describe all the forces of nature. And that is what we thought we should be doing in science. So what did we do uh, earlier? Uh, this is uh, the empirical laws of electrodynamics. We have Ampere's law, Faraday's law, Gauss's electrostatic law, Gauss's magnetostatic law, Lenz's law, and Lorentz's force law. When Maxwell did his work, he took the first four of these equations, and he combined them, and he was able to combine the explanation of electric and magnetic phenomena. He was able to show the wave nature of light. He was able to show the foundation of optics. So if you ask Maxwell, how did you do? He says, I did great. But later on, 100 years, 100 years, or not 100 years, 50 years later, uh, Einstein comes along and adds special relativity to it because there's some things that were missing. But Maxwell didn't live long enough, so he didn't. He was, he was satisfied all the time. He was alive. But we started adding these other things on. So uh, if we want to do a better job than Maxwell did, what Newton said to do is we need to take all two sets of these force laws, of these empirical laws, and use them as our axioms to derive a more complete version of electrodynamics. So that's what he said to do. But before we do that, um, I need to tell you that whenever we develop a scientific theory, we always make certain idealizations. The idealizations are practical. They make the, the equation simpler to solve. Uh, and this is a natural thing to do. I never thought about an idealization as being bad when I was going through graduate school and my undergraduate in physics. I never thought that was a practical way to do things. But um, Newton was very critical of idealizations. Now, he had two idealizations in his mechanics. He had the idealization of mass. And if you ask Newton what is mass, he says, well, that's a property of matter. If you cut a lump of matter in half, you have half as much mass. And you ask him, well, what is mass? Is it some property of matter? He said, yeah, it's some property, but I don't know what it is. But he says, I can represent it with this constant, M, and it works. I mean, if engineers and all kinds of people use it, and they're happy with it. The other, the other idealization was the uh, force of gravity was a uh, non-local action at a distance force. And he, didn't, he tried using ether and all kinds of mechanisms, but he couldn't explain the to his satisfaction, the how it could be a uh, action at a distance. So he had two idealizations, and uh, he just left them there. He says, "People in the future will do better," but we've made great progress. So be happy, and people were happy with what he did. Okay, now in the case of electrodynamics, this fellow Robert Hofstadter did electron scattering experiments on protons and neutrons. And in the theory of uh, electrodynamics, for instance, a proton was a point particle. Uh, that was an idealization. Uh, and he found, oh, it's not a point particle. It has a size of 2.5 times 10 to the minus 13 centimeters, or 2.5 fermions. And he also found out that, uh, like, the neutron here has a plus charge, and it's got a part with a negative charge, and it's got another part with another plus charge has three substructures, and the proton also has three substructures. So the idea of a point particle misses all the structure, misses the finite size, misses electrical feedback effects, misses a whole lot of stuff. So um, Newton said, hey, get rid of these idealizations if you know they're false, and you know something about them. 
So that's what we're going to do. There's another man named William Hooper who got his degrees at University of California at Berkeley, and he measured a lot of properties of electromagnetic field. In particular, he measured the uh, properties, the induced and static of the induced and static fields, electric magnetic fields. He measured 14 different properties of these fields. And he found that there were three types of electric fields and three types of magnetic fields. There was the static field, the induced field that's time dependent, and the induced field that is velocity dependent. And he found that they had different properties. And so one of the different properties, for instance, is the static field and the time dependent field can be shielded but in the experiments he performed, he showed you could not uh, shield the velocity-dependent forces due to Lorenz's law. So <coughs> the, uh, those, uh, those properties were very interesting. He also found that the electric and magnetic fields remain attached to their source, and they have tensile strength. So that means that at this point right here, the fields of all the charges and all the atoms in the universe have a component. And their kinetic energy and everything have a little bit of, of it from all those particles. So I could devise an apparatus to capture that energy and use it. And we call that a free energy generator. And uh, you'll find they're in use particularly in China right now, they were invented in America, but our government does not allow them to be used. Uh, they're they're all sealed yeah. in warehouses. Although the Amish, I live down in Southern Maryland, the Amish do have one that was not banned because it only produces uh, a few amperes of current. And they use it to recharge their batteries and their buses because they don't have electricity in the house. So <laughs> that's what they use it for. So anyway, we have these things, so we need to take them into account. This makes the electric and magnetic field a local contact field, and the electric force becomes a local contact force, which is very important uh, for many uh, philosophers. The next thing we want to look at and take into account is the Michelson-Morley experiment of 1886. This is uh, Michelson Morley, and uh, <coughs> this is not their famous experiment. Their famous experiment is the one of 1887 where they were looking for the heat. This one, they have a source of light and they pass it through a channel here that has water in it. And one beam goes around this way uh, and it opposes the uh, direction of the water flow. And the other one goes the other way and it goes parallel to the direction of water flow. And you beat the two together and you find out what happens to the velocity of light. Well, when that experiment was first done in 1886, it didn't agree with any theory that we had. And then along came Einstein in 1905, and he did his special theory of relativity, and he predicted the results that were measured. And then, unfortunately for Einstein, in 1912, Ewald, and in 1916, Osim discovered an effect which wasn't taken into account, called the extinction effect. And that was applied to this experiment by Fox in 1962 and by Renshaw in 1996. And they showed, and on the whole, this is the prediction of special relativity theory taking into account the extinction effect where C prime is equal to C, the velocity of light is the same in all reference frames, and they found that the C prime is equal to C plus or minus B according to Galilean relativity. So the um, assumption of special relativity was invalidated experimentally. This is, as far as I know, the only the most principal experiment that shows that. Conclusion. So now taking into account those things and removing those idealizations, here are our six empirical equations. <coughs> and if you look, we have eight unknowns. One of those is R prime and other one's T prime, which is another different frame of reference. So what we're doing is we're adding two equations to so these six. We're adding the equations of Galilean relativity, R prime equals R minus B T and T prime equals T. And we solve these equations by substitution. And uh, I have my book here called The Universal Force, derived from the more perfect union of the atoms.
want to see all the details of that, I have copies of, uh, available uh, for purchase at uh, the regular price of the conference system. <laughs> <laughs> so, what happens when we solve them? Well, the, the, the first thing you look at is Linz's Law. Mm -hmm. Linz's Law was not included by, by Max. And so when we look at the solution for Linz's Law, we get something that goes as 1 minus beta squared over the cube root of 1 minus beta squared times square root beta minus root naught. Does that look familiar? Yeah. Does that look like special relativity theory? No. It is. <coughs> it looks identical. And in fact, uh, what, it's, what it's saying is when I move a body with structure that's electromagnetic with a certain velocity, it changes its shape. The fields are altered that come out, and it's all due to the electrical feedback of finite size structure. So the, a lot of electrical engineers are very familiar with electrical feedback. If you had a tube TV, I can tell you that they shielded all a lot of parts in order to keep the electrical feedback from messing up your picture, because it would. And uh, so we, we know that anything electronic has electrical feedback, and you, if it's important, you have to shield it. So uh, that was the first thing we noticed. And by the way, this, this is the part, Lenz's law is the part that is, is the velocity dependence, which cannot be shielded. So the only part that you can actually shield is the other part. So this part you cannot shield. And this gives rise to a lot of entanglements and other types of experiments which have been uh, attributed to quantum effects in fact. So this is the this is the total value for the force. Notice we have two terms. One term is uh, goes one over r squared, like Maxwell would have gotten, and the second one goes as r cross r cross beta. And uh, actually both of these terms are identical to what you get from Maxwell's equation combined with special relativity. The difference is this equation, this approach, conserves energy and momentum, but Maxwell's approach does not. And so we define an energy potential, U of RV, and it looks like a relativistic type of form. And uh, so let's compare that with uh, Maxwell's approach. So here's Maxwell's equation. Now Maxwell's equations don't use an energy potential, they use a vector potential. What is a vector potential? A vector potential is a construct of vector calculus. It has no relationship to physical quantities. It is non-unique and no non-unique quantity can be related to physical things, such as an energy potential. So, so that is this is not based on conservation of energy and momentum, and this, but this is the force law. We have two identical force laws at, cons at uh, constant velocity from two different theories of electrodynamics. They are identical at constant velocity. They both make the same prediction. What does the current theory uh, of scientific method say? If two theories predict the same thing, they're both true, because they're not falsified by the data. But you can go further. You can extend the total force for the electromagnetic force if you have an energy potential using this relationship that the derivative of the energy potential is equal to minus the force as a function of R, V, and A, no function of A in the Maxwell equation form dot V if you have a constant force. So you derive that and here's what you get. There's your, your A term and your R cross R cross A term. So now we have extended electrodynamics uh, and the force law, but we're not through. We can go further. We want to extend it to radiation reactions get the DADP terms, so we will now have two terms that are missing from uh, Maxwell's equations. So you can do this by calculating the total power radiated, and when you calculate that, you get three terms. 
two of them are subject to boundary conditions, and the third one is not. If you go to the laboratory, you know, like an accelerator, where I used to work, Space Radiation Effects Laboratory in Newport News, uh, we, we measured this. And uh, what we found is experimentally, this third term is what you measure experimentally. You don't measure anything. These don't make any contribution. So one says, well, what kind of boundary condition would cause these two terms to go away? And it turns out you have to have periodic toroidal charge rings that make up whatever body you're looking at, whether it's an element, a particle, or an atom, or uh, <coughs> a nucleus. So, so anyway, so that's if we obtain a condition on the structure of all elementary particles from this radiation reaction, and we obtain one more term in our force law. So now we have uh, a more extended force law, which is not possible from Maxwell's uh, approach with the line of special relativity. And we have eliminated, uh, I don't have time to show it here, but we've eliminated 10 idealizations from Maxwell's work. And we also eliminated 10 idealizations from special relativity. So uh, we have made the theory more acceptable to scientists because if they know that the fundamental assumptions or the axioms of the theory are in violation of experimental data, it's a black box against the theory. So what do we obtain? We obtain uh, all elementary particles are composed of these toroidal rings. The toroidal rings are not quite as simple as I showed here. They actually look like fibers wrapping around the toroid. And these fibers go around the cross section as, around, as well as around the circumference. So we have two periodic motions that are in each of these fibers. And the number of fibers and the charge <coughs> on the fibers determines the structure of the complete set of elementary particles and we use combinatorial geometry to get the complete set and to make the identification uh, with each specific element and particle. We also, from one of just the structure of one of these rings, we're able to predict and calculate for the first time in the history of science the value of Planck's constant. No previous theory has been able to predict the value. They have to take that from the measurement comparison with experimental data. We do not with this. And it has to do with <coughs> this formula. And it's basically related to the law of the large circumferential radius over the cross-sectional radius. Excuse me, Charles. How do you determine R, uh, capital R and small r? On what basis do you determine you those? You take your force law, you use Mathematica, and you ask for a balance of forces, and it will pop right out into that. In other words, you ask, or it has to be stable. You, have to, you ask, what is the stability condition, and what is the ratio of these two things in the stability condition, and that determines the value of H. And, and, what, get, and what is capital R and small r? What is capital R and the um, R is very close to the constant, uh, 2 pi r is the constant wavelength yeah. for electrons, and uh, the small r is the thickness, and it's a lot. And this is not very thick. It's very, very tiny. Okay. And, and what, what enables this to um, have equilibrium is the we have uh, Coulomb's law trying to push it apart, and we have Ampere's law with a continuous current holding it together. So the two balance at a particular rate, and that determines the uh, event. So now, um, we, uh, according to what we did before, we said, well, we should be able to calculate the, the gravitational force, inertial force, other forces from electrodynamics if we had a better version. Well, it turns out that there is a hierarchy of electromagnetic interactions. We have the charge to charge, called the Coulomb force. We have the charge to vibrating neutral electric dipole that produces the force of inertia and defines inertial mass. And we have vibrating neutral electric dipole and the vibrating neutral electric dipole, which defines the gravitational force, which is always attractive and defines the gravitational mass. So I know also big G. So <coughs> we now have uh, the secondary forces 
What, how uh, strong is the gravitational force compared to the, the Coulomb force? 10 to the minus 39 in power. That means it's 1 million, billion, billion, billion as strong <laughs> as the electromagnetic force. So this is a very tiny effect, relatively speaking. <laughs> but we think of gravity as controlling the universe because the electromagnetic forces are kind of averaged out. So uh, it, it, in our solar system, uh, we, we didn't even attribute anything to electromagnetic forces until recently when we discovered the electromagnetic currents going between the Earth and the Sun and the, the strength of those currents when we began to realize that's very strong. <laughs> you don't need, a, if you, you don't need a very many uh, unequalized charges on the Earth to balance out the force of gravity. Oh, if I may, I comment on that. Yes. Uh, my field is space plasma. I work at NASA Goddard, and so yeah. in my work, uh, studying solar wind and the boundary interaction of solar wind with the magnetosphere, uh, in all my work for 35 years, uh, the to first order, I've never used the gravity term because it's so negligible <laughs> considering the dynamics and energy of the associated plasma uh, compound. So it's just <laughs> oh, that just confirms this. <laughs> 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 sort of saying what you're saying. Right, right. So with respect to this application, yeah. uh, you know, gravity is negligible. Right, and then when NASA first put up the X-ray uh, telescopes into space, and they started looking out, they found there was a big source of X-rays behind them, and behind the satellite was the Earth. So they turned the satellite around to see what it was, and they discovered that the, uh, there were a certain number of large thunderstorms at most times on the Earth, and they put up current. Now we normally think of lightning as going up to the cloud and stopping and going from the cloud down to the earth. What they found was the lightning went up through the cloud all the way to the sun and it was putting out x-rays the whole way. And that was dwarfing the x-rays that they were looking for from outer space. So, so anyway, that was an interesting discovery and uh, that apparently the, the, the particles that come down at the uh, North and South Pole in the Aurora there, they uh, eventually get back to the sun uh, through these currents to, uh, from the large thunderstorm. Okay, so we want to now see what, what do we get if we calculate the force of the Earth. So here's our picture. Here's an electron, which is bigger than a proton, although it's much less mass. And since the proton is more massive, we approximate this in our realization. <coughs> <laughs> as that, since the proton is 1,836 times as massive as the, as the electron, that most of the motion, most of the vibration is due to the electron. And uh, so when we do that, and we just do a straightforward calculation, this is what we get. <coughs> A1 is the amplitude of the dipole uh, oscillation, and omega 1 is the frequency. And we get two terms. The first term is proportional to acceleration, and the second term is proportional to r cross r cross a squared. So when we do that, uh, we find that, oh, the coefficient of the acceleration, this, is the definition of inertial mass. Has anyone ever defined inertial mass before? No. No one knew what mass was. Newton even said so. Einstein said so. He didn't know what mass was. Now we have the first definition of inertial mass. If we use that definition on the second term, we find we have another term that has never been proposed before for the force of inertia. But we're going to see, we know of experiments where this term makes a major contribution. Can you tell us what this major contribution is at this point? You know, you say new inertial corkscrew motion. You know, can you right, this give us an example? It's going to control the orbits of the planets. It's going to quantize the orbits of the planets in the solar system to show the quantization of, uh, well, not this, this term, but the, the gravity one. But this is going to show the unusual gyroscope experiment that Eric Blaithwaite did, which cannot be explained from the first term. So the normal way we analyze a gyroscope, you cannot show that what Eric Blaithwaite showed in his experiment is valid. In fact, for, for doing that, the physicists in Great Britain 
stripped him of his Royal <laughs> Society membership. They had the government cancel all their research contracts with him to make the high-speed electric railroad. And so it ended up in Japan and China and around Germany. It's not in Great Britain, but they could have had it first. But they, they, they were so inflamed by the fact, the suggestion that he did an experiment that violated the law. And so, be careful when you do your experiments. <laughs> so, if there's what is the evidence that this new theory of inertia is better than the previous theories of inertia? Well, the first thing is, whenever you have a vibrating electric dipole, because the charges are accelerating back and forth, they must radiate continuously. Now, if I have a body, like the Earth, the the atoms in the center are going to radiate, but that, that radiation won't escape from the Earth. Another, another uh, vibrated neutral electric dipole will capture it and absorb it uh, before it gets to the surface of the Earth. But those on the surface, when they radiate, it escapes from the Earth. So slowly, depending on the volume, the larger the volume, the slower the decay. The, uh, the mass, the, the uh, mass of the, the inertial mass of the body will decrease with the cat. So we, can you see that? And the answer is yes. If you calculate that for something like hydrogen gas and helium gas, you discover you get the 2.7 degree Kelvin cosmic background radiation. Are, so you, are you saying if, if I take a large hydrogen or helium tank down a mine somewhere, which is, uh, that, and I'll take a, uh, a radio receiver that I will in the down the bottom of the mine, two kilometers below the Earth, be able to measure this cosmic uh, radiation then? No, you're not. you won't be able to do it that way because you've got the Earth around it. You've got to be on the surface. So it turns out that what, what what is the source of the cosmic background radiation? But you just told it's, me it's uh, it's, it's vibrating electrons. That's what you're telling me. Right. So it's, it, I can measure that anyway. Ninety-five percent of the universe is consists of helium and hydrogen gas. Correct. Okay. So it's not in the planets. It's not in the stars. Yeah, but I can take in a tank down. I can take a tank down underground. So you're telling uh, you can propose an experiment that I can take a tank down. Uh, underground, and we should be measuring this. Uh, no, uh, you won't measure because you'll you know, you'll get everything from the Earth. Uh, what will I get from the Earth? The same decay. You get the decay from the Earth, which is at a different temperature. It's not 2.7 degrees Kelvin. The Earth has a higher temperature. So I'll be, be able to measure the what? Uh, okay, you mean the ambient temperature? So you yeah, you could measure that temperature from from the radiation that comes off. Uh, due to the equilibrium. So, so anyway, the second thing is that conservation of energy plus the decay of the inertial mass requires the velocity of spiral galaxies to exceed the Newtonian predicted values. But we have predicted what's called the modified Newtonian dynamics that predicts many properties of uh, astronomical bodies, including the constant velocity of the outer spiral arms of spiral galaxy, but many other things. I'll show some of them. And uh, then the non-radial term explains the gyroscope experiments are very late. So let's look at some of that data. Here is the, uh, this is the prediction from hydrogen and helium gas for the cosmic background radiation. Now, the other elements contribute something, but it's imperceptible on this curve. And so uh, this in the past has been uh, assigned to Big Bang, but we find it just has to do with the simple decay of mass, according to this approach. <coughs> this is the spiral galaxy graph, which is for NGC 6946. This is the prediction of Newtonian theory and general relativity theory, because there's no relativistic velocities here. And this blue stuff is the actual measured data, and this yellow line is our prediction <coughs> for modified Newtonian dynamics. Uh, the modified Newtonian dynamics that works with all these spiral galaxies was not discovered by us. It was discovered by an Israeli scientist. However, he didn't know the 
source or the origin, but he did define it, and he found he had a, he had a fundamental constant in it, and we were able to predict the form and the constant. So he was pleased that someone could do that. And so, but that's not all that we can explain with that. It turns out that there is uh, luminosity is a function of galaxies, is a function of rotational velocity. We're able to predict that because the modified Newtonian dynamics enables us to predict that. We are also able to predict the velocity as a function of the size of the galaxy, and we're able to predict the frequency of the radiation coming out, and this is quantized on a galaxy basis. It's periodic, and this periodicity, we'll discover, is the same as the periodicity uh, for gravity, which we call uh, the, uh, 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 we, we attribute to, uh, I can't remember that was uh, uh, okay. uh, Well, Stanley German did the modern version of Bozov, to both. To both, who was a contemporary. Did you vote? Yes. So, so anyway, so that, that is an uh, interesting uh, way to be able to make those predictions. No other theory can do this to this degree of accuracy. And make sense of it. Whoops. Okay, this is, uh, uh, let me see if I can do it here. Uh, I'll try to get it to work. I'll describe what's on the video. It's on the internet. You can see it. You look up Eric Lathwaite under YouTube. Uh, he is spinning up a very heavy 40 pound weight gyroscope that he can barely lift with two hands uh, on a long pole. And then he spins it up, and on with one hand on the end of the pole, farthest from the weights, he is able to pick it up and easily lift it above his head. And he says it's as light as a feather. And you say, well, what happened to gravity? What can the can uh, our gyroscope equations predict this? And the answer is they can predict some effects, but not the effect he saw. He basically had the gyroscope way. And in order to he did a Christmas lecture at Oxford University in which he had a child do this who couldn't even pick up the, the, the gyroscope. And they put him on a scale to see what happened when he picked it up and moved it above his head to see what his weight was. And his weight didn't change. And so uh, that, was, uh, that was the experiment that got in control. <laughs> With the uh, Royal Society of London. OK. Let's go on and do the next uh, slide here. This is. Um, the electrodynamic force of gravity. Uh, this is the way we do the calculation. The details are in my book. You want to see the step-by-step derivation. But basically, you've got a proton here, an electron, and a proton here, an electron. Electrons are doing most of the vibrating. And we have four terms to the force, and we add them up. And it turns out that uh, the static force is 
add to zero, the vector force is add to zero, and only the b over c to the fourth power uh, make a contribution in your own negative. So here is the uh, value we obtained for the force of gravity in terms of the frequencies of the two vibrating dipoles. And if we write this in the notation we're familiar with, this is the normal Newtonian uh, force of gravity, and this is a second term, which is not in Newtonian uh, gravity, nor is it in Einstein's general theory of relativity. So if this form term can be shown to exist, what's the most superior form of gravity? It's so many, because uh, the others can predict this. What is this going to predict? It's going to predict the quantization of the orbits, the planets in our solar system, known as Bode's Law. It's going to predict a tilt of the uh, plane of the uh, orbits of the planets with respect to the equatorial plane of the sun, uh, and many other things. So here's uh, all the things that we expect due to the, the vibrate, the decay of the vibrating electric dipoles. We expect the force of gravity to decay over time. And so what will happen? The Earth will expand due to a declining force of gravity. The Earth's angular rate of rotation will slow. The Earth's magnetic field will decay. The Moon will recede from the Earth. And guess what? Hubble's redshift law is now found to be due to gravitational redshift, not the Doppler shift. So we have a different interpretation of what we're seeing in terms of redshifts and what the Hubble's constant means. We also are going to see, these are the, the quantization of uh, the orbits of the planets, the University of Bell's Law, and we're going to see the quantization of all galaxy redshifts again in force and protocol. So let's take a look at some of the things. This is the official map of the world at low resolution by the U.S. Navy, requiring us to for permission to do that. And it shows that the expansion, the separation of the continents is due to a three-dimensional expansion of the Earth that started here at the position of the Dead Sea, went down the Red Sea into the Indian Ocean, forked to form the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. If you want to see what this looks like at higher resolution, here's a picture. Now let's just take this. See these stretch marks here? These are like mountain ranges in the bottom of the ocean. They're not trivial structures. These structures, these stretch marks, together form most of the surface of the Earth, dwarfing the, what are all the continents. So let's take a look. Look at these straight lines. You see this? This shows where this part of this continent used to be connected, right there. And you can see that this kind of goes together. And you can see in every case, whether whatever ocean you look in, you can see where that used to be attached. Another source of uh, U.S. Navy uh, data is they use magnetometers behind their ships. And they measure the magnetic field uh, at a certain depth in the water. And from that, they can get the magnetic properties of the bottom of the ocean. And this is what they found. This is the Mid-Atlantic Ocean Ridge. Each color is a different strength of magnetic field. And notice that there are parallel stripes on both sides of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And if you look at these stripes in detail, you'll discover that they are wider as you get closer to the continents and narrower as you get closer to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And that means that the rate of expansion of the Earth is slowing down due to the uh, R cubed volume effect. And it also means that the Earth has only expanded in its entire history. It has never contracted, and it has not been a constant size. And the, the uh, planets, I mean, the continents do not move back and forth. They do not rotate. Uh, they here is the 3D evidence for 3D expansion of the Earth from the measurement of the tectonic plates. You see this 
this is mid atlantic ridge. You see the arrow on each side is going away from each other? That's an expansion. But to go toward one another, that would be subduction. So what we find is all the major oceans were produced by three-dimensional expansion. And it just also gives us the expansion rate in terms of, uh, I think it's millimeters or centimeters per year. It's very slow now compared to the past. Uh, this is a movie, if I can play it. <laughs> Let's see if I can. By the way, this is done by Neil Adams, who is the the person who produces Batman and Superman comics. He's using his art cartoon capabilities to show the in person. P naught is the 
rotation period of the sun, and Pn is the period of the various planets. Notice that they lie very well on a straight line. That's quantization. It's the quantum law right there. Is it just the planets that do that? No. I have one for the moons of the various planets, and they also have the same line where the period of the planet is equal to, uh, is related to the period of each of the moons going around. So it's, uh, it's more than a coincidence, I think, that they all have the same quantum law. And we'll see that it's not just within our solar system, it's a more universal uh, This is the Hubble force law. Uh, and the, what we see, observe experimentally, is the farther away a star or galaxy is, the light uh, for the redshift is larger the farther away it seems to be. But when we look at these in detail, like this is uh, NGC 4319, and it has a uh, quasar in it, and it's attached to the, to the rest of the uh, galaxy, we discover that the the redshift is drastically different between the two parts, so that they couldn't possibly be due to Doppler shift. I'm queuing. You're running a few minutes left. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, this, if we take the quantization of all, if we look at the, all redshifts that we've been able to observe in the universe from the Earth, which is two million light years from the center of the universe, and from according to cosmic background radiation, if we replot them by distance from the center of the universe, we get Bode's law again with five uh, periods. And these represent basically five rings of galaxies about the center of the universe. And so we discover Bode's law again. But that's all. So we can stop at this point and take questions. I'd like to make, like to make one comment about the photograph you had up there with the uh, galaxy and the other object below it. Just have right it connected right there. Uh, uh, Arp uh, found that that was that's 205, the small one. Can you see 205? Yeah, that's uh, okay. Mark 205. All right. Now there was an article in Sky and Telescope magazine several years ago that disputed that. And you know what they did? <laughs> they said this is BS. It doesn't didn't happen. It doesn't look that way. They had it turned 90 degrees in in their presentation in Sky and Telescope magazine, and they told you down there to look at it and, and find to find the bridge connecting the two. They lied. They had it turned 90 degrees, and they were asking you to look down below it, below the galaxy. They lied about that to show that ARC was wrong, and, and that's correct, what you just said. Right. And there's two different red one. shifts, and they're connected. ARC has found a number more of these, so it's not just this one. <laughs> yeah. And, and so what it means is that, uh, there's, that our interpretation of the red shift is being due primarily to gravitational red shift. Uh, it's got a good chance of being right. And the Doppler shift, which does exist, is a small Small parameter added to the gravitational region. So that's why they're scattered, it's not a perfect straight line. Other questions? Well, I hope you got an idea of the possibilities of an alternate approach that's classically based. Uh, and uh, we didn't say too much about it from the beginning, but from the arguments from uh, meta theory, uh, that we expect the, uh, this approach to produce a better theory of the atom, a better theory of the nucleus, a better theory of elementary particles, a better theory of molecules, and to also explain the origin of life on the molecular basis, which no previous theory has done. It turns out that life is due to the longitudinal vibration in electronic structures and organic molecules. And they have a kind of a spiraling and that has a very nice longitudinal vibration. 
which uh, is not, it's not transverse, it's longitudinal. In, in Maxwell's work, uh, people today reinterpret it uh, uh, that there's no longitudinal radiation. But you can easily measure longitudinal radiation from those radar systems, and every living system that is alive is giving off longitudinal radiation. You can go on the internet and buy an experimental life energy meter and measure it for yourself. <laughs> So we were talking about periodicities in the previous talk, and those are showing up. They're, they seem to have electrodynamic origin, but that seems to be the common factor uh, in, in a lot of things. We are, this electrodynamic periodicity is showing up. And that's due to these R cross R cross V and R cross R cross A. Thank you.